In this video, a remarkable tale of courage from Laval City in Canada has gained widespread attention. According to law enforcement, a teenager's quick thinking played a pivotal role in rescuing a woman who had recently been abducted by her abusive ex-boyfriend. Now I realize what I did and wow, it's really awesome. I mean, I saved a life. <laughs> The extraordinary actions of 17-year-old Malik Bonnet have made him the subject of admiration, with people eager to take photos with him. The story unfolded earlier this month at a bus station where Bonnet witnessed a man mistreating a young woman. I approached a little bit, I followed them, and they asked me for money. Without hesitation, he obtained the money from a nearby convenience store and, finding a moment alone, the woman confided in him about her need for assistance. Bonnet devised a plan to accompany them on the bus, ensuring he could keep a watchful eye on the situation. When they are in the public places, the guy didn't, don't really act violent with her. After a brief bus ride, Bonnet proposed buying food at a nearby Tim Hortons, seizing the opportunity to make a call to the police while banning a trip to the restroom. The relief in the woman's eyes upon realizing help was on the way was palpable. She just looked at me, with, she was almost crying. And I told myself like I did good. Bonnet's actions were undeniably courageous, and not only did the police express their gratitude, but they also collected $250 to show their appreciation. Our case dates back to January 30th, 2017, and it commences with dash cam footage capturing a vehicle being pulled over by the police. Upon the driver's exit, law enforcement officers, visibly armed, instruct the driver to move away from the vehicle. Hey, be here, get on your PA! Be here, get on your PA! Call him up! Prior to the driver's exit, one of the officers can be heard repeatedly mentioning the presence of a passenger. There is a passenger! There is a passenger! The dash cam continues to roll for several minutes, showing the passenger disembarking from the vehicle and undergoing a pat down for any weapons or dangerous items. Hands up! Hands up, passenger! Get on the ground, passenger! All the way! Yeah, I got passenger, I got passenger. The passenger, at this point, is described as an individual with long hair and a hoodie, though their gender remains unclear from the footage. Watch it, there's movement! Don't move, don't you move! Yes, sir. Stay down! Yes, sir. Approximately three and a half minutes into the recording, the perspective shifts to a chest cam, providing a clearer view of the driver who is seen stepping away from the car. The driver is identified as a male suspect wearing suspenders and a t-shirt, but curiously, he is barefoot. The officer's rifle momentarily obstructs the view, but another officer approaches the suspect with a spine-chilling question. Where's the key to the chains? At just over four minutes into the footage, it becomes evident that this is no ordinary traffic stop. The footage then shows the driver being placed in the back of the police vehicle, while from a different angle, the passenger undergoes a pat-down before also being placed in the back seat. Both appear to be without shoes. The perspective remains the same as an officer approaches the pulled-over car. As the officer approaches, another officer can be heard saying, Get a camera on this thing. Yeah. Put a camera on this thing. What unfolds next is nothing short of shocking. A woman, visibly distressed and crying frantically, is discovered chained by her neck inside the vehicle. Do you need me to say anything about what happened or anything? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just hold on for now, okay? Just hold on, okay? I want to take some pictures. We have the evidence. She's tight chained down by the neck. Okay, go ahead. She is struggling to catch her breath, nearly hyperventilating as she sobs. Her face is obscured for her protection, but even with the censoring, the image remains heart-wrenching. As the officer moves away from the car, she pleads, Please lock them up. While it's challenging to discern her exact words, the officers around the vehicle are attentive to her. Shortly thereafter, another officer begins to remove the chains, the sound of which is audible. Come this way. Hold on. 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 Hold
The woman exits the vehicle, still hyperventilating and in tears, and expresses her gratitude, saying, Oh my God, how did you find me? As the police continue to remove the chains from her body, she reveals that she was choked multiple times. Even though she is now safe, it is clear that the woman is deeply traumatized by her ordeal. He choked me Sarge, like six times. We don't have, I don't got a key for this one, guys. Sarge, I don't got a key for the neck one. Okay. There it is, here it is. Okay, hold on. Once freed from the chains, she begins to share with the officers what truly happened to her. I was in Las Vegas. He broke into my Las Vegas apartment and stole me from my home. Las Vegas, Mexico? Nevada. Nevada? He fucking hauled ass. Do you know the guy? Yeah, he's boyfriend. my ex-boyfriend. How did you know? They called us and told us. Who did? I was up at the office trying to run him see if we had anything on him. Oh my God. She discloses that she was forcibly taken from her own home by someone she had once trusted, her ex-boyfriend. He abducted her, placed her in his vehicle, and then subjected her to this horrifying ordeal. This woman's experience is nothing short of a nightmare. <laughs> he dragged me out of the place and I so hard because I was like, this is how you die. And I think a neighbor saw me getting dragged out. The woman, who identifies herself as Jane, is then taken to an ambulance to begin her treatment and recovery. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, step up, okay? Watch out. Let you guys hear the footage shifts to the perspective of the back seat of the vehicle from the beginning, where we see the driver, Jane's ex-boyfriend. Though the audio quality is poor, the man's facial expressions suggest that something is amiss. When he looks into the camera, it's as if he's peering into your soul. After several minutes of complete silence, the perpetrator starts singing a song under his breath and then asks a rather unusual question. It's unsettling to hear someone who has just committed such a heinous act inquire about hymns. However, the most disturbing part is yet to come. He proceeds to sing the entirety of Amazing Grace with only minor variations. The discomfort of the police officers is palpable as the singing persists for minutes. The man then declares that he is a Christian and requests access to his Bible and hymnal from his truck. It appears that he is more concerned about these books than he was about the well-being of his ex-girlfriend. You a Christian man? Yeah, I am. You? I am. In my, uh, in my van, there's a, a Bible, a Nelson Bible, and a Baptist hymnal. Are there any chances I can get those? I'm pretty sure. It's gonna, your vehicle's gonna be right up the road anyway, so... He exits the vehicle, leaving a disconcerting comment in his wake. Put him hold down. No girls. Wear shoes next time. One can only hope that such an incident will not happen again. The footage transitions to the back seat of another vehicle, which now contains the passenger from the kidnapped vehicle being transported to the police station. I thought you were handing me the hat. What's that? I thought you were handing me the hat. Oh, okay. It's cold back there. It is kinda. The accomplice makes several unsuccessful attempts to engage in conversation with the officer driving the car and spends most of the journey in silence. Can you help me out? Hold on. Well, I don't think I need the help. Upon arrival at the police station, the accomplice exits the vehicle and the footage concludes. Subsequently, it was revealed that the abduction's objective was to take Jane to a cave brainwash her, and coerce her into marrying either Jack Morgan, her ex-boyfriend, or Sophie Brown, Jack's new partner. Both Jack and Sophie face charges of kidnapping and false imprisonment. The Columbia County Sheriff's Office in Wisconsin was inundated with frantic 911 calls around 3 a.m. on January 14, 2023, reporting an exceedingly uncommon and unfortunate incident. In this startling event, a woman's vehicle was stolen while she remained inside. Shaw County has the female on the phone now. Uh, they are going westbound. 
Houston, Florida. Did you see anything? The woman, whose identity remains unknown, had been taking a nap in the car's back seat while her husband went into the Love's truck stop where they were parked. She awoke to a nightmarish scenario as her vehicle was being driven recklessly at high speeds by a complete stranger. The dramatic sequence of events was captured on Police Pursuit Vehicle's dash cam. Amidst the deafening roar of the engine and radio chatter between the pursuit officer and the station, it became evident that the officer was pushing the speedometer past 90 miles per hour but was still struggling to catch up to the suspect. Desperately, the officer requested spike strips to slow down the fleeing vehicle. After several minutes of pursuit, the officer finally closed the gap on the kidnapper. He maintained communication with the station as the suspect approached the requested spike strip. 33, looks like negative spikes, negative spikes. We're going to be heading eastbound State Highway 60. Intersection of Pulvermacher, Highway 60, no traffic, roads are clear. Unfortunately, the visibly intoxicated driver managed to evade the trap, prolonging the pursuit. The officer then reported exceeding speeds of 100 miles per hour, with the kidnapper still managing to stay ahead. 33, we're 100 miles an hour, westbound 60, Pulvermacher. However, a glimmer of hope emerged as it became clear that the spike strip had, in fact, worked, even though it wasn't immediately apparent. 33, 33, just lost the tire. Vehicle appears to be spiked, still going. On the rims, looks like we're going to be coming to a stop. Barda and 60, Barda and 60, suspect still going. The vehicle lost a tire, causing a significant decrease in speed, allowing the officer to stay in close pursuit. As the vehicle continued, it eventually lost its second tire. Uh, we're coming around the big S curbs, still approaching Barton Road. Looks like a uh, suspect's losing a uh, second tire now. 33 33, suspect is in oncoming lane of traffic, westbound, oncoming lane of traffic, eastbound. The footage then switched to another officer setting up a second spike strip further down the road. While it initially appeared to miss, the officer confirmed his effectiveness. Several other police vehicles joining the chase. The relentless kidnapper refused to yield, even going off the road at least once before regaining control of the nearly willless vehicle. 33, 33, approaching the four corners, appears all four tires are deflated. Brad load I shell. At a certain point, the pursuing officer decided it was necessary to put an end to the chase once and for all, as the suspect showed no intention of stopping or pulling over. Consequently, they resorted to using force. The footage vividly captured the moment when the lead police vehicle forcefully collided with the kidnapper's car's rear passenger side. This impact caused the vehicle to fishtail, skid off the road, and crash into a barrier with other police cars quickly moving in to secure it. 33, 33, I copy successful with my squad. The collision was so violent that it triggered the deployment of the car's airbags, obscuring the officer's view of the vehicle's interior. They proceeded cautiously to extract the kidnapper and ensure the woman's safety. 3331 at gunpoint, have EMS on standby, full airbag deployment. I'm going to come around this side and we're going to open that door. I have a cannon, you will get bit. Keep your hands up. Hands are up, I can see hands up. Side. Come around and get this Where's the female at? Hands are up. Back passenger door. The perspective of the footage shifted several times during this tense situation, but it was evident that a K-9 unit was on scene to discourage any escape attempts by the kidnapper. Slow down, get her out. Keep your hands there. Do not move. Do not move. 
Amidst barking from the canine and the shouting orders from the police, the suspect repeatedly declared that he was unarmed. Eventually, the kidnapper managed to exit the vehicle before being forcefully apprehended by an impassioned officer. Put your hands behind your head! Put your hands behind your head! Josh, 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 it's okay, we got it, we got it. I'm not taking no chances here, I'm not doing anything. Even fellow officers had to intervene to calm down the particularly zealous officer who expressed, I'm not taking any chances. The kidnapper was handcuffed, and the police returned to the vehicle to search for evidence. Before concluding, the footage briefly shifted back to the canine's handler who praised the dog for its performance. Truly a commendable canine. Oh boy, you talk to With the kidnapper now in custody, the woman's harrowing ordeal had come to an end, and the police approached her to offer medical attention, which she declined. However, it was evident that she was deeply shaken by the entire experience. Thank you so much. Do you want EMS to check out? No, no, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. Are you sure? Yes, I just cared because okay. he was driving like crazy, yes. and I couldn't, I couldn't talk with him. He didn't want to stop. I don't know if he's crazy or what happened with him. Okay. You're okay. I am. Are you sure? Definitely. Okay. I'm just right. scared. I'll be back to talk to you in a few minutes, okay? Okay. My name is Sergeant Stage. You can just call me Ron, okay? Okay. Once the chaos subsided, the police identified the kidnapper as Kyle M. Wagner, a 51-year-old male from New York. Subsequently, investigations revealed that he had consumed fentanyl and methamphetamine within 24 hours of the kidnapping, as evidenced by items found in his own vehicle after it was searched. Kyle faced multiple charges, including felony eluding, false imprisonment, operating a vehicle while intoxicated, possession of methamphetamine, possession of drug paraphernalia, and potentially others. On the night of July 5th, 2022, at approximately 1 a.m. in Albuquerque, New Mexico, a pickup truck was pulled over due to suspected driving under the influence, DUI. The reason for the stop was the truck's erratic and swerving behavior. As an officer approached the driver's side window, he was met by Jeremy Guthrie, a 41-year-old man who indeed appeared to be under the influence of alcohol. Bunch of kids in the car. How many kids? You have one, two, three, four, five, six. Who are these kids to you? Uh, this is my friend. That's your friend? However, the situation took a more disturbing turn when it was discovered that Guthrie had six underage teenagers, a combination of both boys and girls, as passengers in the vehicle. In his inebriated state, Guthrie acknowledged these young passengers as his friends. If you are starting to feel queasy, your deepest concerns are on the verge of being realized. The chest camera footage of the event captures the initial encounter between the police and Guthrie after they initiate the traffic stop, and it doesn't kick off on a positive note. Hey there. Hello. How are you? All right. Just all right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Should you drive license? When requested to provide his identification, Guthrie commences to search through a clutter in his car. This process continues for some time until the officer points out that the items he's seeking are already on his lap. There's a wallet right there between your legs. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Guthrie's actions do not align with those of a sober individual, steadily reinforcing the suspicion of alcohol involvement. The officer proceeds to clarify the reasons behind Guthrie's traffic stop and the factors that raise suspicions. Specifically, the officer was concerned about a potential collision due to Guthrie's erratic driving. Huh? That's it. You mentioned that you were nervous? Right. I was nervous while I was behind you driving down I-40. You were in lane number one at times. You went all the way from lane number one all the way over. Then you were a signal. Had problems keeping the lane. Your, 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 your vehicle one lane. And then when you merge on from uh, westbound 40 to northbound 25, you took that curve way too fast. I did. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were going to crash. No, I don't. I didn't say. I don't think so. I'm just saying I thought you were going to crash. It was during this explanation that the officer shifts the focus to the presence of minors in the vehicle. At this point, Guthrie makes a claim that the young girl in the passenger seat, who is evidently a minor, is actually 18 years old. How old's your friend? 
18. That girl's not 18? Huh? That girl's not 18? Yeah. No, she's not. No, I don't think she is. That girl's not 18. Trust me. She don't look 18. However, this marks the beginning of a troubling turn of events. Subsequently, the officer directly questions the girl about her age, but she declines to provide an answer. Ma'am, how old are you? I didn't ask you your name. I asked you how old, uh, how old you were. This prompts the officer to request Guthrie's exit from the vehicle, revealing another unsettling detail. Come on out. Not only were Guthrie's pants unfastened, but they were secured with buttons instead of a zipper. If this detail doesn't strongly suggest a concerning situation, it's difficult to imagine what would. Why's your, why, why's your zipper or your buttons down in your crotch? <laughs> well, I probably just forgot. Okay. Initially, Guthrie attempts to account for his inappropriate state by claiming he merely forgot to fasten his pants after using the restroom. However, his level of intoxication is so evident that it's almost as if you can witness the struggle in his mind to formulate coherent responses. Subsequently, the officer initiates an inquiry into Guthrie's alcohol consumption that evening. Initially, Guthrie asserts that he hasn't consumed any alcoholic beverages, but later he contradicts himself by admitting to having had a few drinks several hours earlier. The officer promptly detects this inconsistency in Guthrie's account, highlighting his inability to keep pace with the officer's line of questioning. What did you last drink? Like, probably, um, it's been a, it's been a little while. Like, an hour? I would say it's more than a, it, yeah, like more maybe two, yeah, roughly. Okay. Like two hours. Like. That's fair, because you know what? Two hours is totally is, is totally different than no, I haven't been drinking. You know what I mean? Following that, the officer revisits the issue of the miners in the vehicle, and Guthrie appears reluctant to provide a response. He reiterates that they are his friends and openly acknowledges his own age, stating that he is 41 years old. Recognizing the difficulty in obtaining coherent answers from Guthrie, the officer decides to shift his focus to questioning the passengers. At the outset, the teenagers display resistance and are unwilling to cooperate with the police's inquiries. However, it doesn't take long for the officer to persuade them to be forthcoming. They disclose their true ages, revealing that they are all either 13 or 14 years old, which is significantly below the legal age and certainly not an appropriate age group to be associating with a 41-year-old man they barely know. How old are you? 14. 14. Thank you. Simple, simple question. 14. For, really 14? Yes, sir. Okay. 14. Okay. 13. Okay. 14? Okay. okay. Who is this guy to anybody? Uh, that's our old news. And then she knows his kid. Okay. So... That there's your homie? Or, okay, so you, you, you guys all need to call your parents. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, and have your parents meet, meet us here. When the officer proceeds to assist the teenagers in contacting their parents to arrange for their pickup, and he even engages in conversations with a few parents to update them on the situation. So this is this is Sergeant Lafayette with State Police, and your, your son, along with... I'm guessing three, uh, five, five of the other buddies, they were in a, they were in a vehicle with somebody who, some man, it's a, it's a, it's a grown adult, who has, who has no business driving, and so he's out now doing a field sobriety tests, and these kids need to be picked up. Meanwhile, another officer administers sobriety test to Guthrie, who remains as intoxicated and disoriented as before. Just to make sure that you're okay to drive, okay, uh, would you mind uh, doing a couple of field sobriety tests just to make sure? Yeah. Yeah? You would mind or would, or you, you would want to do them? Initially hesitant to participate in the test, likely due to his awareness of potential failure, Guthrie decides to take the test after being informed that refusal would result in his arrest. Are you going to stop the test then? I'll, I'll still, I can still test. Following a stumble to the final sobriety test, the officers place Guthrie under arrest and load him into the back of their vehicle. Before the footage concludes, Guthrie once again appears perplexed, this time being informed of his Miranda rights. Do you understand each of these rights as I've explained to you? Uh, Sorry, could you say that again? Yes or no? Okay. Yes or no? 
Jeremy got three faces charges of driving under the influence and six counts of child abuse. Subsequently, the case expanded to encompass charges of sexual assault against a minor. This revelation emerged when it was disclosed that Guthrie had been involved in a relationship with one of the 13-year-olds in his car since she was 12, and that he had impregnated her. Tragically, the pregnancy ended up in a miscarriage, and it was later reported that even after he was put behind bars, Guthrie continued to communicate with the girl using a cell phone of one of the guards. On July 16, 2023, at approximately 11 p.m., law enforcement in Fayetteville, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta, received a report indicating an ongoing kidnapping. At that initial juncture, the police could not have foreseen the profound tragedy that would unfold in the hours to come. The events began when 20-year-old Cameron Hopkins arrived late in the evening at a Wingstop restaurant where his ex-girlfriend, Kalia Jones, was on her work shift. To gather information about the incident, investigators interviewed a couple of patrons who were present in the restaurant that night. What happened is, when we came in, uh, I don't even recall whether he was already here or he came in after we were here. He proceeded to go in the back, uh, accosted her back toward the rear of the store, grabbed her by the arm, and uh, walked her out again with a weapon. According to their accounts, Hopkins initially appeared to be an ordinary customer. However, his impatience became apparent when he ventured to the back of the restaurant. There, he forcibly removed Jones from the premises and compelled her into his car at gunpoint, loading a handgun of some sort. Chest cam footage captures officers inside the pursuit vehicle as they engage in a high-speed chase with speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour to apprehend Hopkins. While this particular chest cam perspective doesn't offer a clear view, it does reveal the rapid passing of trees and streetlights through the windshield as the driver makes determined efforts to catch up to Hopkins. 400, about 105. Big down the road, coming up by the road. He's blacking out. This perilous pursuit unfolds amidst precarious conditions, with unsuspecting citizens navigating oncoming traffic during their evening routines. The chase spans from Fayette County into Clayton County as Hopkins attempts to elude law enforcement. Subsequently, dash cam footage records the pivotal moment when the police decide to terminate the pursuit by forcefully colliding with the kidnapper's car as it turns into Lovejoy High School. This action is followed by a horrifying turn of events. Radio, shots fired, shots fired. Hey, I'm behind you, I'm behind you. I don't know. Up right here, they're still in the vehicle with shots being fired. Here is the bus, Clayton. Gunshots emanate from the kidnapper's vehicle as officers exit their own, plunging the situation into a significantly more dangerous and volatile state. Positioned behind their vehicle, the officers seek refuge with their firearms at the ready, awaiting further instructions. Although the provided footage leaves the subsequent events undisclosed, according to reports, Cameron initiated gunfire at the police from within his car, subsequently directing his weapons towards Kalia Jones and firing multiple shots. Subsequently, the police deployed chemical irritants into his vehicle, effectively persuading Hopkins to surrender. He's coming out. No, I got this up. He's coming up. Down him right there by the car. The, the passenger door. Climb out. Yeah, he's going to climb out. Yeah, that's make him climb out. Get out of the car! Get out come of out. the car! Just come out of the car for us! Get on the ground! Get on the ground, man! Let me see you! Let me see you! On the ground! On the ground! Regrettably, even from their observation point, it was evident to the officers that Kalia Jones could not endure her injuries. Subsequently, in the video, Hopkins' cries for Jones are audible as police administer water to his eyes to alleviate the effects of the chemicals they had employed. Okay, you guys, you no, because the gun went off on her. Okay, okay. Right. We're not arguing with you, dude. All right, we're stick gonna, your head hey, out. Stick your head out. We're going to jump this on you so you can get some of that OC out of your eye. Turn this one. Turn your head the other way. Where is she? Yes or no? Do you want more water? Can I use more? Allegedly. Hopkins informed the police that Jones had possession of the firearm and had caused a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Although this assertion is met with skepticism by law enforcement, one officer remarked, 
I doubt the veracity of a statement. Which he's full, I, I think he's full of shit. He says she had the gun and she shot herself. No, it was but. him. I could clean his day. He was coming around with me. That's yeah. my I, I'm just saying, that's what yeah. he... Well, I know. Well, that's when you jumped out and I jumped yeah. out. I heard the shot. So I was, Cameron Hopkins is currently confronting charges that include kidnapping, aggravated assault in Fayette County, and possession of a weapon in connection with murder in Clayton County. As soon as the victim starts speaking, it becomes evident that she's making an effort to speak softly, and the reason behind this is truly distressing. Her abductor is lying right beside her on the bed, fast asleep. And this amplifies the confirmation of the imminent danger she senses and the dreadful possibility of something even more horrifying occurring. She's restrained, unable to retreat to the bathroom to await assistance from emergency services out of fear that her captor might awaken and realize her actions. Whenever it feels like her voice is elevating, the emergency operator advises her to discreetly lower the phone to avoid arousing suspicion. The woman is consumed by anxiety, repeatedly inquiring about how much longer she must wait. How much longer? What? How much longer? The anticipation of rescue transforms into an excruciatingly nerve-wracking ordeal, and this victim endures the torment of her fears while anxiously awaiting salvation. When the police officers finally reach her location, she summons the courage to approach the door, urgently pleading for them to hurry. Hurry, hurry. Fear is palpable in her voice, and the hushed tone sends shivers of dread down my spine. Eventually, the police successfully extricate her from the premises, simultaneously apprehending her troubled captor, who, fortunately, remained asleep throughout the entire call. What price wouldn't you pay to uncover the events that transpired in the moments leading up to a tragic incident? In this particular case, it concerns a heartbreaking kidnapping involving a young girl abducted by the man captured in the video footage. This distressing event unfolded right in the front yard of a hub located in southeast Atlanta. The girl's boyfriend placed the 911 call, wasting no time with his initial words. There's somebody just left with my girlfriend. His voice trembled with fear and panic, and as he continued speaking to the emergency dispatcher, his growing anxiety became increasingly evident. Oh, I just watched her get kidnapped from in front of my house. What the? Swear words involuntarily escaped his lips, and his voice steadily escalated in tandem with his fear. She had a gun pointed to her? Yes, I watched it all through my window in my front yard. He had a gun to her and he forced her into a car. He had on a security shirt. The kidnapper, menacingly wielding a firearm, coerced the young lady into a vehicle. Yet, what adds an additional layer of distress to this young man's ordeal is the fact that the kidnapper was dressed in a security uniform. This leaves us pondering whether he was a legitimate security personnel or someone who had somehow obtained the uniform. Undoubtedly, this young man will bear the scars of what he witnessed from the vantage point of his bedroom window, and it's undeniable that witnessing harm befall someone you deeply care for carries a far greater emotional burden than being in danger yourself. We can only hope that he finds a way to heal from the trauma. What resonates through this 911 call is the heart-wrenching sound of a terrified, sobbing woman who has just witnessed a harrowing brush with death. Fortunately, at the time of the call, she was safe. The man in the black shirt who can be seen in the video is the kidnapper. He had made an attempt to abduct the victim but was startled by an eyewitness and hastily fled the scene, leaving the woman behind. Consider the gravity of the situation had the eyewitness not arrived on the scene precisely when they did, quickly scaling a fence and chasing the kidnapper away. In the 911 recording, the caller can be heard communicating with the person on the other end, likely the emergency call taker. I just saw some guy just trying to abduct a girl. I'm on the side of the road, but she's got no shirt. Where are you? Where are you? I'm right by Archer <laughs> Hotel on the side of the road. In such a moment, hearing reassuring words like, you're on the phone with the police, I have officers on the way, must be the most comforting words imaginable. You're on the phone with the police, and I have cars on the way. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know where he went. He took off when I slammed up my brakes. Stay on the line with me, okay? Stay okay. on the line. You're okay. They're coming. This call was placed at 8.30 p.m., and the woman involved maintains that she has no knowledge of this dangerous man. 
The sheer randomness of this incident is striking, and the fear she experienced is magnified threefold. If the previous victim experienced a stroke of luck, this current situation might be even luckier. However, before delving into that, let's address the distressing 911 calls, a heart-rending and agonizing experience. I need help. Somebody, one of my friends, picked me up and threw me in the back of their truck. Please help. I don't know what's going on. Okay, where, where are you going? Do you know where you're going? I don't know. The call was fraught with difficulty as the network connection faltered, with her voice breaking and numerous chaotic events unfolding simultaneously as she placed the call. Hey honey, we're going to help, okay? We've got people coming from everywhere. It's astonishing to consider that she made this call while inside the back of a truck, and the situation becomes all the more terrifying when one realizes that the person responsible is someone she considered a friend. She had no idea where he was taking her and her voice quivered with tears, exuding a sense of desperation as she implored the police for assistance, uttering the plea, please help me, I don't want to die. Fortunately, the authorities swiftly sprang into action and managed to trace the truck's location using the victim's phone's GPS. The vehicle was intercepted, and the victim was liberated from the clutches of the malnevolent kidnapper, who must have surely been taken aback by his own folly. After all, who kidnaps a person and leaves them in possession of their phone. Criminals often display a remarkable lack of foresight. Emergency call takers encounter a multitude of distressing situations on a daily basis, but incidents like this one, or those resembling it, must leave them astounded and speechless. The girl on the other end of the line had vanished from the public eye for a decade until she suddenly re-emerged in the news. She introduced herself in a rushed, breathless manner, her words tumbling out rapidly. Help me, I'm Amanda Berry. You need police, fire, or ambulance? I need police. Okay, and what's going on there? I've been kidnapped, and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm, I'm here, I'm free now. Okay, and what's your address? Uh, 2207 Seymour Avenue. She anticipated that the person on the receiving end of the call would instantly recognize her as her abduction had been a widely known event over a decade ago. She stated her grim truth saying, I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years and proceeded to disclose her location. Amanda's voice cracked with emotion, conveying her eagerness to reclaim her freedom as she spoke to the 911 operator. In the background, the sound of crying echoed, originating from two other women who had disappeared from the same neighborhood Albeit years apart, Amanda had been abducted on her way home from work. Gina was taken while walking home from school a year ago, and Michelle Knight had left a cousin's house not far from her own when she too was seized. Now, after all these years, this distressing call has come through, and the terrified Amanda desperately implores the police to arrive as swiftly as possible. There is a lingering suspicion that their kidnapper may not have ventured far and could return at any moment to reassert control and thwart the authorities, just as they had successfully done for a decade. Instances of bravery don't come much more remarkable than this, and neither do the stakes. For what unfolds here is the remarkable courage and intelligence of an eight-year-old girl. She responded in the most astute manner to ensure the safety of herself and her younger brother from the clutches of a kidnapper. The children's father had briefly left them in the car with the engine running while he went into a store. Presenting an opportunity the kidnapper seized upon, without hesitation, she hopped into the car and drove away. This is where the lady, and this is where the lady was sitting. She looked at the car and she saw it running and she saw kids in it, then she just got in it and drove away. The young girl desperately pounded on the glass, but her cries went unnoticed. It was then that she recalled her father had given her a phone for emergencies. They said 911, how may, what's your emergency? And I said, I got, me and my little brother got kidnapped. Then they said, where are you and what do you see? Despite not being able to pinpoint their exact location, she managed to provide a description of what she could see, including reading a sign indicating the Mexico border just before the kidnapper confiscated the phone. Nevertheless, this brave young girl's actions proved invaluable enabling the police to track down and rescue the children while apprehending the kidnapper. There are moments when an intuitive sense of something being amiss turns out to be entirely accurate. In this instance, the scholar is experiencing one of those unsettling moments where it seems that something is indeed going terribly wrong. One, one, two, one, two, one, two. 
Yes, I'm actually in a vehicle at this point in time. I'm going back to a um, civilian home. Um, I am actually from Idaho. I left with a friend of mine. Ended up finding out it was a very, 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 very bad mistake. The 911 operator poses the question. Do you feel like you're being kidnapped? Yes. Okay, where are you? Give me an address. A location. Uh, let something. Me see. Uh, princess is like that. And her response carries an air of confusion, leaving one to wonder whether she might be under the influence of something. Regardless of the potential influence, it is clear that she is facing a genuine threat. The complexity of the situation lies in her inability to provide a clear description of her whereabouts or how the police could effectively locate and assist her. She mentions vague landmarks like benches and a gas station, but becomes increasingly incoherent as she continues to speak. Okay, you need to help me help you. I need an address. Where are you at? He's already talking. No, he's taking me down the wrong side of the wrong road. This raises concerns about the feasibility of the police reaching her, especially given the imprecise nature of her location description, further intensifying the worry for her safety. Some individuals not only commit crimes, but also take it a step further by boasting about their actions, a classic and destructive behavior. However, in certain instances, the motive behind the call is even more perilous than one could fathom. In this case, the kidnapper is being pursued by the police, and in an attempt to evade capture and secure a clean getaway with his victim, he resorts to dialing 911. His demand during this chilling introduction is nothing short of terrifying. I am a gentleman from Lakeland. I have kidnapped my ex-fiance if he continues to follow me. Delivered with an icy demeanor. He proceeds to issue threats against the young woman he has in his custody, making it abundantly clear that he intends to carry out these threats. To emphasize his resolve, he puts the young lady on the phone and she, too, harbors no illusions about the intentions of the dangerous man who abducted her. I have been kidnapped and we are being followed. She informs the dispatchers that if those pursuing them do not withdraw, she believes the kidnapper will follow through on his threats the initial call to 911 had been made by the victim's mother, who grew alarmed upon discovering her daughter's belongings near the employee's exit, leading her to believe that her daughter had gone missing. For eight agonizing hours, the young woman was held captive, while her parents were consumed with worry. As you listen to this harrowing drama unfold, there is no doubt that your concern will mirror that of those involved. You're risking this woman's life. We're heading south on I-95. You've got three officers ganging up on me right now, and I have enough ammunition. The kidnapper persistently contacted the dispatchers, repeatedly making threats and demanding to be left alone until he was finally apprehended and the victim was freed. In moments of extreme danger, your sole glimmer of hope often lies in the possibility that your captor will make a single critical error, allowing you to break free from their clutches and reclaim your freedom. We have an active assault, I guess, on the phone, and now it's pinging to an area of Prospect Park. In the case of the man depicted in this video, his kidnappers made the grave mistake of neglecting to confiscate his mobile phone when they seized him. With him confined to the trunk of the vehicle visible on the screen, it's also worth acknowledging the invaluable role played by GPS systems. Without the capability to track positions in real time, locating this man might not have been a swift. From the cramped confines of the car's trunk, this individual managed to make a crucial call to 911, conveying his dire circumstances. The dispatchers could discern signs of a struggle in the background, immediately recognizing that something was profoundly amiss. It was, uh, indicated that they could hear uh, a beating taking place while they were on the phone with him. They sprang into action, collaborating with the cell phone carrier to triangulate his location to within a mere 300 meters of the phone's coordinates. This expedited response led them to discover him in a nearby wooded area and their prompt actions undoubtedly played a pivotal role in preserving his life. The harrowing tone in the voice of the woman featured in this video is enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. She is gripped by fear, anguish, and sheer panic, her voice rising with distress and cracking under the weight of her suffering. I'm in the way of I'm being kidnapped. P please, somebody help me, she pleads desperately. When the call abruptly ends, 
The additional sounds captured, coupled with the woman's frantic demeanor, strongly suggest that the phone may have been forcibly wrestled from her hand while she remained connected. Indeed, we hear her shouting at someone, Get off of me! And her voice carries the unmistakable trace of pain and terror. Even if you were initially unaware of the extent of her peril, you can unmistakably feel the imminent danger she faces. The situation escalates further as a kidnapper's voice can be heard issuing demands, commanding her to surrender her car and money. Meanwhile, the 911 operators remain on the line, urgently inquiring about the direction in which the vehicle is traveling. All the while, the woman persists in her calls for help, valiantly attempting to fend off her assailants. Which direction are you going? It's apparent that there are likely two individuals involved in this attempted kidnapping, prompting admiration for her remarkable bravery particularly when you consider the daunting courage it must have taken to confront these dangerous criminals, resolute in their intent to steal her car and abduct her. Here's the positive outcome. She successfully managed to break free from her captors, and the police have already made at least one arrest in connection with this assault and attempted kidnapping.